Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And a welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for you as usual. And Jim, we start with fantastic news. <laughs> One of the greatest Olympic moments, period, certainly the greatest Winter Olympic moment ever, was the Miracle on Ice in uh, 1980. And a lot of people hearken back to that a few days ago when the U.S. in dramatic fashion in a shootout defeated Russia in Olympic men's hockey pool play. And while we celebrated that vigorously, it was always in the back of our mind, you know what, we're probably going to have to play them again along the way if we keep winning. Turns out we won't, because the Finns beat the Russians today in the quarterfinals, which means not only will the Russians not get to play the Americans again, they don't even have a chance at a medal. Vladimir Putin has been at all these games. This has been a huge deal for him to get the Russians back on top of the Olympic podium in men's hockey. This is the event he cared about the most. And so on top of the warmest Olympics ever, so our skiers are basically working with slush and uh, the, the Bob Costas pink eye epidemic. Uh, Jim, this Olympics just gets better and better. I like to think of it as a Soviet red eye uh, <laughs> there, Greg. You know, <clears throat> I, I, there's a headline right now on USA Today. The Russian hockey team just ruined the Sochi Olympics for Russia. And if that doesn't make you just want to start chanting USA or even Finland, you know, F-I-N, F-I-N, <laughs> you should do so because Putin is a bad guy. Also, the only thing that has really gone right for Russia on this Olympics so far, and I'm knocking on wood because there's another week to go, no terror attacks as far as we can tell. And in a way, that is a fairly significant accomplishment and victory, and I would salute the Russian security forces if things hold out. Having said that, as you mentioned, this is not the, the snow Olympics. This is slush. Uh, there's a Washington Post columnist who said the snow around here looks like soup, a creamy bisque that seems harmless enough until the athletes plunge into it and find the hard crags of the Caucasus beneath, which is when the medics race out. The sounds of the Sochi games are a whack and the clatter of boards and skis followed by whales, or worse, a terrible stillness. The mounting crash toll includes a broken back, a broken jaw, and an assortment of head injuries. The logo for this Olympics ought to be a stretcher. The lesson of this International Olympic Committee is never give Russia anything because they will find a way to louse it up and uh, disastrous. It is kind of fun to see the blowing up in Putin's face, and it is great to see the U.S. doing a pretty good job. I understand we're still tied in the, in the, in the medal standings, so they had a little harder time getting the golds. But anything that embarrasses Putin is good news for us and perhaps a slightly easier path for the United States to get that gold medal in the hockey competition. Yeah, absolutely. We still have to play today, and if we win, we'll probably play Canada. So it's certainly not an easy road for the U.S., but to know that we beat the Russians the one and only time we were going to play them in these Olympics is certainly a nice thing. Jim, you and I are, are roughly the same age. We uh, were in high school at the time of the official end of the Cold War, and so when we're excited today about beating the Ruskies in the Olympics, a lot of people at least look at me and say, it's not the same. Why are you so excited about beating Russia? It's not like it's the Soviet Union anymore. And darn it, I tell them, when you grow up in the Cold War, that was one of the best things about watching the Olympics. You cheer for the Americans, and if they don't win, you cheer for another Western European team. And if they can't win, you hope the commies fall on their butts. It's hard to get that out of your mind. While it's wonderful that the Cold War has ended, let's not buy into that NBC opening ceremony propaganda. <laughs> you know, the Cold War mostly looked like Mad Men with a different color palette and, you know, them driving around with their rampant consumerism. Because if anything marked communist Soviet Union, it was rampant consumerism. You know, <laughs> look, this country's leadership was an evil empire, as accurately described by that. And, and since then, they've been more of a little autocratic and aggressive. You know, I'm one of the few people who seems to remember that, you know, remember how the Beijing Olympics began? Yes. With Russia invading Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and that's that's not keeping in the Olympic spirit, okay? You know, Russia you know, done a lot to warrant its villain status, and there's nothing wrong with rooting against them, particularly since this is a relatively nonviolent way of resolving conflicts and expressing uh, nationalist pride. I, I, I'd be rather disturbed if people didn't feel any stirring of, let's go out and beat the Russians uh, this game. It's, it's, it's their role in American life, it would seem. <laughs> 
Uh, and if you really are that worried about it, look, well, don't worry, the Chinese are coming along to fill that gap pretty soon anyway. So. <laughs> yes, let's hope these Olympics don't end with the Russians invading the Ukraine. So, uh, But that's another story for another time. On to Martini number two now. And Jim, if there's anything the Democrats are hating the last couple of weeks, it's probably the Congressional Budget Office, which uh, they touted so proudly back when they were rolling out their various versions of Obamacare and tweaking it just so, so that they could get the right projections on costs and so forth four or five years ago. Well, now uh, we've certainly already seen the estimates on job losses due to Obamacare. Now we're seeing the estimate on job losses due to the president's push for a minimum wage rising to $10.10 an hour. It looks like, according to this estimate, at least half a million jobs will probably be ended, uh, possibly somewhere between half a million and a million. The White House, of course, looking at different numbers, pointing that 900,000 people will be raised out of poverty and that about 16 million people will probably get a raise. So they're spinning those aspects of it. And they, of course, accuse the right of cherry picking. But that's a pretty important cherry, the half a million job losses there. Yeah, it could be up to about a million uh, on the less optimistic assessments. Look, we can argue whether you will come out to you know the, the lower end of that figure or the higher end of that figure. Uh, the, the bottom line is that if you raise the minimum wage, it does eliminate some of those starter jobs for people on the bottom. Now, you might argue that the raise the minimum, what those currently making minimum wage who won't lose their jobs outweighs the cost of those losing their jobs because of the higher minimum wage. And, and you know, we can have that argument. The problem is that the Obama administration and most Democrats in Congress want to deny that this trade off exists. They want to basically believe that their policies are all upside, no downside, nobody ever gets hurt. And the only reason you could oppose it is because of, you know, corporate greed or you're with the richest 1% or something like that. And that's it's a fundamentally immature approach to this. The interesting thing, the CBO report obviously hasn't you know, changed many people's minds on this. Democrats continue to insist, you know, that the CBO is possessed and, and interpreting demon spirits and, you know, things like that. You know, they, they, they just don't want to acknowledge political realities and economic realities, which is kind of frustrating about this. And we, we can't have a productive and useful discussion of this if one side insists that their ideas are all upside and no downside, and the other side is trying to more accurately reflect what's going on there. So frustrating, not surprising. Now, you might be saying, well, look, if this hurts workers, why are Democrats pushing for it? Because a lot of unions target their wages to what the minimum wage is. So if the minimum wage goes up, union wages go up. And as a result of that, when the contracts get renewed or, or automatic increases or things like that, which gives the unions more money to use in their political campaigns and stuff. So what a very simple, basic way, if you're wondering why union workers, who generally don't make minimum wage, are pushing so hard for the minimum wage to be increased, it's because it ultimately means more money in their pockets. And uh, that aspect of the debate almost never gets mentioned in the discussions of the minimum wage. It certainly doesn't. And Republicans, as much as the logic and the math work to their favor, the polls do not yet on this issue. So it'll be interesting to see how that debate plays out. As we know, income inequality is going to be one of the key Democratic themes uh, this year. So uh, get ready for that to be a major part of the campaign strategy. All right, on to Martini number three now. And we have been chronicling from time to time, of course, the work of James O'Keefe and Project Veritas. We saw them with ACORN. We saw them with NPR. We've seen them with various other entities, a voter ID from state to state during the primaries in 2012, which was both entertaining and troubling at the same time. Right now, they're focused a lot on Battleground Texas. That's this left-leaning group designed to turn Texas blue. They're closely affiliated with the Wendy Davis campaign. They've also been working with uh, the Health and Human Services Department's Enroll America on the Obamacare front. And the latest video from Project Veritas very clearly exposes how Battleground Texas is basically breaking the law in terms of how they take information off of voter registration forms and use them to their political advantage. Here's an extended excerpt from the latest Project Veritas video. According to the Secretary of State, it's unlawful to transcribe, copy, or otherwise record a telephone number off voter registration cards, which is something Jennifer Langoria reveals Battleground Texas is doing multiple times. Langoria reveals a series of databases called VAN, where Battleground maintains registered voters. The first database, My Voters, is a list of all the registered voters Battleground Texas received from the Secretary of State. The second tab of the database is the voters that Battleground has personally registered. Langori reveals they have taken these numbers off of the forms. Every time we register somebody to vote, we keep their name, number, and phone number. And they have to send them to the voter registration form. 
And there you go, Jim. Might not be the most egregious violation of the law. Most people probably didn't even know what the election law was, but they clearly do, and they're flagrantly violating it anyway. I've got a bit, kind of a basic lesson of life that applies to those who work in politics or, or really any particular field that you're in. Let your conscience be your guide. And if that doesn't work, assume that everyone you meet is secretly recording you for James O'Keefe. <laughs> Uh, because he manages to get his people everywhere. He manages to catch them on camera. Metaphorically speaking, O'Keefe's cameraman always seems to come up and say, say, are we doing anything illegal here? Ha ha. And the person <laughs> always seems to say, yes, let me show you. And, and inevitably, they did, then promptly go do it. Even if it's a, a small technical violation of the law, the law says you're not supposed to copy you know, phone numbers. Don't do it. And if you, if you don't like the law, try to change the law. Don't, you know, decide to ignore it because what you're doing is more important for the greater good and all that stuff. The other thing which is always kind of fascinating about uh, James O'Keefe has taught us a lot about how the world works. So what is the traditional process of a James O'Keefe video, Greg? You've seen enough of these. Well, you figure out a problem that likely exists. You go undercover, you poke around and basically get either unsuspecting or uh, naively compliant people to admit exactly what you thought they were doing that they are doing. And then we always hear, this is just low-level employees. This is just some poorly managed, poorly trained front office staff. It's only an isolated case. And then the next video comes. And then the next video comes. And then the next, and all of a sudden it turns out this is fairly widespread. And so what's kind of interesting is that these large organizations, always full of self-righteousness, always convinced that they're making the world a better place, when confronted with the evidence that their organization is either violating the law in this case, or as we all remember in the Acorn cases, willing to help pimps and prostitutes involved in illegal immigrant smuggling and stuff like that. First they deny it, and then once it's on video, they say, oh, it's just this one case, and it turns out that there are a bunch of other cases. And they, it never seems to prompt the soul-searching you'd hope that it would trigger, that, that this is not, these are not organizations full of good people with respect for the law and respect for doing it. These are organizations full of power-hungry folks who basically are willing to do whatever they feel is necessary, regardless of the law, regardless of more, usual morality, because they're the good guys, because what they're doing is so noble and important. And uh, I, I salute James O'Keefe for pointing this out and saying, uh, no, <laughs> the laws apply to you, too, even if you think you're doing a great thing by being a political activist for all these hoity-toity, wonderful liberal causes. Jim, I'm guessing that recording anybody of that nature in a federal building would probably be against the law. But don't you wish with the low-level employee excuse that somehow they could have gotten into Lois Lerner's office or at least around her at a oh. re restaurant somewhere to, to really kind of blow the lid off that story? That is the now traditional, it was just a bunch of low-level employees in Cincinnati. Is now, I, we need a macro for that in Microsoft Word, because that's so often offered as the excuse for these sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, that's, we've now been almost internalized by every large organization, including the federal government. And uh, you kind of wonder if you could do this sort of stuff inside a federal building without risk of prosecution, what would uh, James O'Keefe's cameras find? Mm, yeah, well, well, I guess we'll probably never find out on that front, but... It would be nice to know, and if anyone could do it, it would probably be his gang. So, Jim, keep enjoying the fact that the Russians aren't going to get a hockey medal. Go USA. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. <laughs> Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And please join us again on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch. <laughs>